um, yeah, my name is Sammy Castonway, and uh, I'm with Friends of Viawaihi, is the entity or organization that's really hosting this. Um, locally, the Ontario Community Library has been kind enough to sort of collaborate on this um, during, during COVID, right? A lot of us are, are home and we're craving more education and more material. And I don't know about you, but I oftentimes go to my public library when I'm, when I'm craving some kind of public presentation. Um, and right now it's very difficult to do that. So the public library has um, kind of allowed this collaboration so we can um, go back to our, our kind of stargazing public presentations at the library, but do it online. And what I've picked up is that's brought a lot of new folks to us, right? Uh, like Bill out there in Lake Oswego. Um, it's so, I'm so happy that you could join from across Oregon. Um, and also that we can have folks that are right here in Ontario join as well. Um, I'm also joining you from Treasure Valley Community College, as it says there. Um, I'm a, I'm a I'm moonlight, I guess, right? Or I, um, one of my, my second job. Uh, is as an astronomy instructor. Um, actually, I'm an earth science instructor, so I do geology, astronomy. Uh, next term is an energy class. It's quite a bit about um, climate change, environment, and our, and our use of fossil fuels. Okay? Um, and that's where I'm joining you from today is Treasure Valley Community College, just for the ease of uh, kind of a lecture material. So uh, today, what you're signed up for uh, is stargazing. So before I launch into listing off all these stars and pointing at all these things, um, it's really important to me when I'm talking to my astronomy class at college or even these public classes down at the library, that we start off with just some basic things on how to enjoy stargazing. Okay, I think that there's some romanticism here, right? We all want to know about the stars. Um, but really, if you're not patient with yourself, if you're also, if you don't have the right tools and you haven't set up a process, then you might find the stargazing experience annoying or cold, right? Uh, so I'll show you some things to set you up for success. That's number one. And involved in that is also setting your awareness and um, some processes. Okay, um, I'll touch more on those when we get there. Then I really want to hit on the importance of natural night skies. Okay, I'll show you a few slides around light pollution, around, around how you can help prevent light pollution and even how you can become an advocate, like we are here at Friends of the Hawaii, for this beautiful resource, which is the night sky, okay? And one that we would, a resource that we don't wanna see depleted by light pollution. And then um, the last thing here is to really focus on the stars. So last month, we focused on the winter circle. And this month, I'll tell you a little bit about the North Star and some of the other circumpolar constellations. A circum, kind of like a circle or a circumference, and then polar, kind of like the North Pole. Okay. So uh, just some, some gear for stargazing, folks. Um, this is one of my favorite uh, pictures from my syllabus in um, astronomy class. Yeah, I, I make sure that everybody has a list of some clothes, some warm clothes to wear. Now I realize that we're kind of transitioning into spring and the daylight or the sun, the day star, is staying out a little bit later all the time, but the nighttime is still pretty cold. So if you anticipate for the next couple of months doing some stargazing, I highly recommend that you dress appropriately and for something like stargazing where you're out in the cold, appropriately um, can be what might seem like overdressing, okay? Because you want to be comfortable. So some kind of hat that holds in your heat and holds in the heat in your ears. 
Um, some kind of gloves that holds in the heat to your hands uh, can be really important. And then also your feet, some type of good socks, maybe even double layering your socks and some kind of maybe some insulated boots um, or some types of boots or shoes that you're not gonna get cold in, okay? Um, so head, hands and feet, that'll take you a long ways and that'll get you about an extra 15 minutes of stargazing. But if you make sure to wear multiple layers, just like we do while we're out camping, right? Um, you know, start with a base layer like a shirt and then at least some kind of long sleeve or a sweatshirt and then a coat. Okay, so at least three layers, and then you can mix and match and add on some others if you'd like to. Oftentimes, I like to bring a blanket to sort of fold over me as well. It kind of seals off all the rest. Okay, and then of course, don't forget about your lower area. Um, some thermal underwear can be nice. Uh, you know, if you don't have thermal underwear or like some yoga pants or some, uh, some tights, um, or long johns, hunting long johns, something like that. Uh, and then, you know, a pair of pants, maybe an insulated pair of pants. And if you, if it doesn't make you uncomfortable, you could put sweatpants on under your normal pants. You know, just adds that extra layer of insulation. Okay. And then, um, so that's a little bit about warm clothes, just to Again, so you have a pleasurable experience while you're out there stargazing and not freezing your butt off, right? That's the worst, the worst. Everybody would hate stargazing then, okay? And then um, I also recommend here this uh, red headlamp, a red headlamp. Now, um, headlamp, so your hands can be free and you can fidget, you can write, you can massage the sky. Okay, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but uh, the red, why the red? Well, the red wavelength, um, remember the, the, the light, when you split it into its multiple parts of the spectrum, it makes a rainbow of all different colors of the spectrum. And the red light that's on the very far end of that spectrum, um, it's a little easier on our eyes than the blasting white light. So while you're outside and you get away from the city lights or maybe get away from the headlights and you start to look up, your eyes are gonna naturally adjust. Your, you know, your pupils will get larger. You'll let more light in and your eyes will begin to adjust to the dark night sky. And you wanna do whatever you can to not ruin that night vision. So don't go staring into somebody's headlights, right? Uh, don't get your phone out and then look at your bright white screen, okay? And then also, if you need to use a flashlight to take notes, then using a red light will help to not ruin your night vision, okay? Um, then also, I recommend some type of uh, a star wheel or, or an app. I mean, you know, there's an app for everything today, so... Uh, probably a lot of you have used one of these apps if you're already interested in the stars or stargazing. And uh, I mean, I'm not going to pull up the app, but it's pretty simple. You know, you did you do you do you and it opens up. And then a lot of times these apps, you can move around the night sky and see the constellations. Okay. You know, it's, it's fun. It, it can be a learning tool. I use it in my class. But what I find is that when we become too dependent on the resource, whether it's a star wheel or the app, then we don't rely on our own skill, okay? So I make a big deal in my class, um, and I will here as well, that let's just learn a couple of basic things slowly, and then they'll, they'll stick up here, right? As long as you practice them. And then, you know, you can use the phone to remind yourself or to share with others, things like that, okay? But I do recommend having some type of resource, a star wheel or, the, or an app like Stellarium that you can use to check your answers, if you will, right? It's kind of like using a calculator to check your math. Okay? If I'm looking up at the stars and I think that I learned the name of that star and that star, it's kind of handy to go ahead and see if I was right before you, you you sort of learn over what you should know, OK? 
Okay, I hope that makes sense. Okay, and then um, lastly, it doesn't hurt to have a little bit of hot cocoa. Okay, um, something to drink, something warm to drink. So there's a couple of reasons for this, obviously. Number one, uh, pretty, pretty obvious is that it warms you up a little bit. Okay, it can give you something warm to hold on to, and it can warm up your, you know, your mouth and your, your gizzards when you're drinking hot cocoa on a cold night. But the second reason that's almost as important is your cup of hot cocoa gives you a timer, kind of a natural timer. Okay, you take out your hot cocoa, maybe you, you sit in a chair, or maybe you stand, right? But drinking that hot cocoa is going to give you, you know, 20 minutes, a half an hour. First, it's going to be piping hot, and then it'll slowly cool down, and you'll finish it. And um, having a timer like that or, or something that kind of keeps you out there, even though maybe you're ready to go in, that can be really helpful for your development. As long as you agree with yourself, okay, I'm going to stay out here until I finish my hot cocoa. Um, that can really help you enjoy the, the in-between part of the experience. What I mean by in-between is walking outside and then walking back inside. Okay, you really want to enjoy the in-between. So take, a, take some hot chocolate um, or you know, something else warm to drink, dress warm, and then use a, a red headlamp for your night vision. Okay? So again, the, the point here is to make this enjoyable, informative, and fun. Okay? What we don't want is to not have a good time, of course, to not learn anything by looking at the stars, um, or to not have fun. Okay. Um, okay, I want to say a few things about setting your awareness. This is just as important as dressing warm. Um, what I mean is uh, to start off, you have to orient yourself in space. Okay, in space. For all introductory stargazing activities, finding north is very important. Okay, sure, we can use the North Star like we're going to talk about later. But you can also use your phone, right? Or you can use a traditional compass, or maybe you have some of those pigeon rocks in your head. I don't know. Okay, but any of those ways, just make sure that you can consistently find north and that you aren't just relying on, I think that that's north, okay? Because it really is going to make a difference when you're watching the night sky change over four or five hours the stars move around and you might get disoriented, okay? So I highly recommend that you, um, before you start stargazing, when you go outside with your hot cocoa, you make sure you know which direction is north. And I'm gonna point this way because in the room that I am in right now, that's, that's north, okay? Um, so there's a traditional compass for you, but there's plenty of ways to find north, okay? Then, um, it's good to know which season you are in. Are you going to look at winter constellations or are you going to look at summer constellations? Okay. So let me make the distinction. Um, it's common practice or it's, uh, let's see, it's, um, it's kind of the standard to refer to uh, winter constellations as those constellations that you see after you eat dinner and you go outside after sunset, okay? Same thing with the summer constellation. If I eat dinner at you know eight o'clock at night in the summer, and I go out when it's dark at 10 o'clock, the stars that are in the southern night sky are referred to as summer constellations. Okay, so why are they different? Why would they be different? Well, remember, uh, or maybe this is this could be new to you, that the stars actually shift in the night sky through time, okay? As we'll look at in a little while when we find the North Star, all of the night sky spins around the North Star. Okay, it's really, really quite phenomenal. So it really does matter the season that you're looking at the stars. Then um, also it helps to know what time the sun sets. Okay, if you're planning on stargazing tonight, 
then you can't go outside right now in Ontario, Oregon. It's still light outside. So while you're planning for stargazing, you're getting all your warm clothes together, you got your hot chocolate, um, you got your red light, and you know where north is, also plan to go out at the appropriate time, okay? Um, so tonight it's about 8.15 or 8 o'clock in Ontario, Oregon. Uh, might be a little bit different in your respective time zones. Then also um, taking note of the sunrise, if you want to do some morning stargazing, which is an absolute pleasure if you're a morning person. Um, unfortunately, in today's material, I'm not going to focus on any morning constellations, uh, but maybe next month. And the morning is a glorious time to stargaze. Oftentimes, if it was cloudy at night or cloudy in the evening, those clouds have dissipated and it's nice and clear in the morning. Um, and then, of course, there's not a lot of traffic, not a lot of, a lot of other people are awake, um, things like that. So morning stargazing can be a lot of fun, too. Then uh, you should also note the phases of the moon. Okay, the moon is a glorious, glorious uh, bright object in the night sky. I like to do moon gazing as well. But um, if, you're, if you're looking for some of the smaller faint stars in a constellation, then the big beacon of the moon can add, and I hate to say it this way, can add a little bit of light pollution. Right? Yeah, it's, I, I hate, I shouldn't call it pollution. It's not polluting anything, but it does bleed some light around in the area where you might be looking for stars. So it doesn't matter too much. You can still stargaze with a full moon, of course, or with a new moon. But depending on the experience that you're looking for, um, a new moon where it's just stars can be a little more approachable than a full moon where your eyes and your gaze feel like going to the moon, okay? Uh, then lastly, uh, I love this one, is thinking about our hands, okay? Um, many of us came fully equipped with hands. Um, you know, and I realize there are unfortunate scenarios where, where you might not be equipped with, with hands or particular uh, fingers or phalanges these days, but um, the, our hands we can use as a rudimentary measuring device, okay? And this is really cool. So if you hold your hand arm's length away, okay, go ahead and do it, go ahead and do it, arm's length away, then interestingly, because the human body has all these interesting ratios, the distance between my finger and my pinky, it doesn't matter how, how big I am, how tall I am, the ratio is going to be the same between my shoulder and my wrist and my pinky or my thumb and my pinky. So what I mean to say is for all different types of anatomy, whether you are, are five foot three or six foot five, that if you hold your arm out or your hand out at arm's length away, then these degrees that are written here are relatively repeatable, okay? Now, there's a degree of error, you know? This isn't science, right? We're not trying to, we're not trying to calculate anything or collect any, any rigorous data. So there's, a, there's an error of, you know, one to three degrees depending on, you know, the size of your thumb. But, um, okay, so hold your, your hand out at arm's length away. If you make a fist, that fist is about 10 degrees, 10 degrees. Your, um, your hand fully extended is about 18 degrees from thumb to pinky. And your single index finger, um, just the standard, is about one and a half degrees. Okay, so this is, this is pretty neat. The stars are so remote from us that we don't have parallax. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, a little bit to this side or to that side, the star and the distance from that star to the next one is going to be the same in these numbers of degrees, okay? Um, I, I love this, right? It's, 
you know, it's just really neat that we uh, that we can do this with your own bare hands. So I think of the movie Moana, and maybe maybe some of you have grandchildren or, or children that watched this movie recently that came out. And there's a scene in this movie, of course, it's about the Polynesian culture, right? Which had amazing gifts for stargazing because they used the night sky for navigation to get from this little tiny island over to that little tiny island. They navigated by the tapestry of the stars. And there's a scene in that movie, Moana, where Moana, she's doing something like this, right? And Maui, he's sitting there, he's, you know, the demigod behind her. And he makes fun of her and he's like, what are you doing? Trying to give the sky a high five? Okay, and I think of that every time. But, um, you know, really this is, is kind of um, maybe connective, right? This is a way where literally you're kind of massaging the sky. You're reaching out to the sky and to these stars and really interacting with it, okay? So maybe some people like telescopes and maybe you have a pair of binoculars. Those are other ways to interact with the sky. But if you haven't tried to interact like this, I highly recommend it, okay? So um, the reason that, we, that I bring this up is uh, when we're looking at constellations and I'm giving you directions from one to the next, it can be really handy for me to say, now go 18 degrees from star seven to star 12, right? If you know what star seven and 12 are. But it, it makes a really neat ruler to go from one star to the next, okay? Uh, really fun practice too. All right, uh, the last thing about setting awareness here is process, okay? Setting a type of process for yourself that's repeatable, okay? Just like basketball or, or driving a car, it's practice that makes perfect, right? Okay, if you keep doing this stuff, you'll get better at it. But also, if you set up a process for success, then you'll get really good at it, okay? So I recommend um, to go along with the process when you're just sitting at home and you're like, okay, I'm gonna go stargazing tonight. You set your awareness, all of the, the previous slides, but also determine where you're going to look, uh, determine what you are intentionally going to look at. So set your intention on one or two or three constellations, not the whole night sky, you'll get overwhelmed, right? Just focus on a couple of things and get to know those really well for that night and then come out tomorrow night for looking at new stuff. Um, then, of course, preparing well. It's part of your process. You're going to dress warm. You're going to have hot cocoa, right? Uh, things like this. And then while you're stargazing, I can't stress this enough, is to look, focus, and practice, okay? Um, looking, focus, and practice. So don't just look at the stars once right? Try to take the method that I'm going to show you and do it multiple times. Okay, that'll, that'll really help. And then um, towards the very end of your stargazing experience, look for something new. And let's call that a new inquiry. You can take that new inquiry inside, and then you can use the Stellarium app, whether that's on your phone or the desktop version. And you can just bring up the stars in the comfort of your own home and kind of navigate around with your new inquiry. Okay, so here's an example. Um, last night, after I was looking at um, Andromeda constellation setting, uh, I noticed a faint red star about seven degrees to the south of Pleiades, the constellation. Okay, so I said a lot of gobbledygook there. But the important thing is, I focused my attention on where to look or where I was looking. If I bring that into Stellarium and I look at that place, I bet we can figure out what star that was, okay? So that's kind of how to go about a new inquiry. And then of course you take your new inquiry from yesterday and you bring that into your stargazing for today, okay? Um, and with that, again, I would suggest learning one thing at a time and then building your experiences. 
Excellent. Okay, um, let's talk a little bit about the importance of natural night skies. Now that you're all geared up as a stargazer, right? You got your warm clothes on and your hot cocoa and your red light, and you know what you're going to look at. But what if what if you go outside and you can't see anything because all the city lights have polluted the night sky? And you know, you and I might laugh here in Ontario or potentially even in Lake Oswego, right? If you're you're closer to a metropolitan area and you might have some light pollution, but really it's not as bad as it gets. Think of Mumbai, India, or think of New York City. Okay, these are areas that are urban and they've been urban for a long time. And we're not gonna reverse light pollution in Las Vegas, right? But what we can do is make sure that areas that are not already polluted can remain that way with simple ordinances or simple um, sort of agreements that we will regulate some of the light, okay, things like that. So um, here's a map of the United States, um, a little bit of Mexico in the South and a little bit of Canada. Um, and the colors here, I think it's, it's pretty self-describing, but um, if this is black, that means totally black, no light pollution, dark night skies. And the, the color variation glows, goes from, from blue all the way through red in the higher um, urban areas and light polluted areas to that white color, which that means, you know, again, here's Chicago. That means that this is very densely polluted. So um, that, and these are in units, uh, I can't recall the light intensity units, but these are in some type of developed units that's talking about the, the darkness of the night sky. So uh, this red, or sorry, the white color, let me give you something to think about here, a comparison. When you look up at the night sky, you know, you're looking at thousands or hundreds of stars, right? In the case in the white, they can see an average of six stars in the night sky. That's what that means. And those are the six brightest stars in the night sky. So Sirius, S-I-R-I-U-S, -I -I is a very bright star in the southern sky right now. And they can see that star in New York or in Chicago. But if it gets any dimmer than Sirius, you're not gonna see those stars. So, I really like looking at a map like this, uh, particularly to look at where I live right now. That's here in Ontario, Oregon. And then this large polygon here is Malheur County. Okay, I'm coming to you, of course, from Malheur County. And then this is the Treasure Valley. This uh, large red center here is Boise, Idaho. We're right here on the uh, Oregon-Idaho border. So you see that the Treasure Valley or Boise, Idaho does add some light pollution to my local area, but it's not very big. It's not very much, okay? Um, it doesn't bleed out so far that I can't see thousands of stars in the night sky, okay? But what happens with population growth and expansion, right? Now, I'm not saying that we, that we limit population growth or expansion for where places for people to live. But while we're doing that, if we go about smart planning, right? If we intentionally decide to not have lighting that adds to the light pollution, but instead minimizes the light pollution, then that's the best of all worlds, right? We still get to make habitat for humans, but we also get to prevent this amazing resource being lost. So uh, this polygon that's outlined here is known as the Oregon Outback Dark Sky Network. And yours truly, friends of the Hawaii, we're part of this network, okay? Um, we've had a couple of calls with these folks and, and frankly, this activity came out of our discussion with, these, uh, with this network is um, we really do want to promote some type of uh, a, a sanctuary, dark sky sanctuary, a preserve. There's all kinds of ways to think about this, but some type of agreement 
in this general area, which involves three states, that we agree when infrastructure occurs that we regulate some of the light to preserve this beautiful resource. Oops. So uh, we are really lucky to not have a lot of light pollution, but other areas have lost that resource and they can't recover it. It's unrecoverable, okay, unless we turn out all the lights. That's not practical. So the first thing is making sensible lighting or well, not making, installing sensible lighting. So here's a pretty good diagram about this idea of sensible lighting. Um, on the far left-hand side, you have unshielded light. So that's a light bulb that's not covered and it's blasting as many watts towards the ground as it is up to space. Who's using the light up in space? Nobody, right? The International Space Station doesn't need our watts from down on Earth. So again, the point here is let's take all this wasted wattage, that's wasted energy that we're projecting out to space. And as you can see progressively towards the right, we bring the light down to where we actually use it. So we can still properly illuminate areas on the ground where we actually go, rather than illuminating very high up uh, where where people are not going to be, unless there's Spider-Man up on the side of a building or something, right? Um, but I think that's unrealistic. So this is a really easy solution that any city can do. Any rancher can do out on, out on their land is make some type of sensible lighting um, that fits for, uh, for natural night skies, or at least preserves natural night skies. Okay, um, I have a second point here which is um, a dark sky preserve, okay? We can actually designate these things. This has been done, okay? This has been done internationally. There's the International Dark Sky Network, but this has also been done uh, on either side of us. Idaho, or at least a portion of um, central Idaho was one of the first United States designations, okay? Uh, and again, this designation is not legally binding. Okay, um, so what happens if you get too much light pollution? Do they come sue you? No, 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 no. It's, it's not legally binding. So that just means that you lose the designation. That's all. That just means that we didn't work hard enough to make proper lighting and we lose the designation. Okay, not, it's not terrible. It's not the end of the world, but we can use these preserves to hold on to dark night skies. And then the, the other one of these on the other side that I really like is uh, Sun River was just the first one of these designated in Oregon. I think that's pretty, pretty fabulous. Um, the idea here isn't to spur on tourism or something. I mean, you know, it doesn't hurt if tourists come, right? But that's not the idea behind this. The idea is really just to preserve this rich resource for future generations, okay? Because we will lose it as we have more light pollution. Okay, it seems like a really simple solution. Okay, um, so I'm, I'm suggesting if you like stars, if you like stargazing, if you like natural dark night skies, then please be an advocate. Please be an advocate for not just the dark sky network here in Oregon, but across the globe. Okay, when you have the chance, when you're talking to so-and-so about the moon or about Mars or about looking at the Milky Way, you know, just be an advocate for dark skies uh, dark sky preservation around the world, okay? Uh, very exciting. Okay, so uh, this, those of you who were here last month might recognize this picture. Um, this comes from the software Stellarium, okay? Uh, pointing to that up there. And again, it's a desktop program. It's also an app. And um, I did mention about the red light. Well, Stellarium, the phone app, actually has a red light. So you can turn off the, the white light and you can turn on a red light. So that kind of makes it for easier viewing when you're out stargazing. Okay. Um, last month, we uh, looked at what's called the winter circle. Now it's not a proper constellation. It's actually a mix of several different constellations. So we call that an asterism. Okay, an asterism is just a, um, a different shape. It's not a formal constellation, okay? 
Um, and this asterism here, you can see, okay, uh, here's the star Sirius that I was talking about a few moments ago, brightest star in the night sky. Okay, um, then this recognizable belt right here, um, that's usually the, the second constellation that people can identify next to the Big Dipper. Uh, so that's Orion's belt. And the constellation Orion extends all the way from up here, okay, that's part of Orion, all the way down here to his, let's see, down here to his feet, that's part of Orion, and then all the way back up here. So Orion, the constellation, takes up quite a lot of space, okay, and then this constellation, the star Aldebaran, is known as the Eye of the Bull, and that's the Taurus constellation. So here's Taurus. It's actually pretty big. Okay, it's a big constellation. Okay, so I've shown you two constellations, but what we looked at last week, rather than just looking at constellations, we looked at all the brightest stars in the night sky. So those of you who were here, you can kind of do a little practice. Those of you who were not, uh, this is you know just a little kernel. So we have Sirius, Rigel, Aldebaran, Capella, Castor, Pollux, and Procyon. So they make this really, okay, it's not a perfect circle, it's an oval, but it makes this really nice feature that you will see every winter in the Southern Hemisphere. Okay, so that's a little review from last time. Um, this was part of the the worksheet that was hand, well, I hate to call it a worksheet, that sounds like homework, right? Um, this was the information sheet that was handed out last month, uh, or at least emailed out. So following this presentation, I'll send you today's slides, I'll send you a similar type of handout, uh, and a little bit of other information. And then you can reply to that email if you'd like to get last month's stuff, I can just send that to you as well. Um, but I'd like a little interaction, okay? Um, so if you're interested in the backlog of last month's stuff, just ask. Okay, so there's our um, winter circle. But today, I would like to focus on the North Star and circumpolar constellations. Again, these are things that circle the pole. So to set our awareness, we're going to look north. Okay, get your compass out. You can do this in your house right now with your phone. That's fine. Okay. Get your compass out and figure out where north is. And then do it again when you go out stargazing, right? Okay. Uh, note we are in the winter season. So we're going to look at winter positions of constellations. Tonight, the sun sets at around 8 p.m. Uh, the moon tonight is about 20% waxing. Uh, about the same as it was last month was about 30% waxing, okay? And then, um, do you remember the degrees of your hands? Did you bring your hands with you, okay? Um, then our process here, we're going to look to the north. We're gonna try to find the pole star via the Big Dipper, okay? Um, and then we'll, uh, I'll take you through a little bit of Stellarium to show you some of these, these positions. And then you, as you're outside, look and practice, and we'll focus, look, focus and practice, okay, uh, several times. And then um, add this one thing that you're learning tonight, or maybe tomorrow night, and then move on to something new like last month's activity. Okay, or maybe you're practicing last month's activity and you're doing this new stuff tonight. All right, uh, so <clears throat> looks like my slide is a little out of order there, sorry. Okay, well, that doesn't help. So uh, I'm looking, I'm using the Stellarium program again. I'm looking to the north at around 8.15 tonight. Okay, looking to the north. And as you look to the north, I want you to find the Big Dipper. Okay, well, that's kind of a big deal, right? I'm just saying, go ahead and find the Big Dipper. But the Big Dipper is one of the most recognizable features in the night sky. Oftentimes, as a, as a child or a young adult, or even as a middle-aged adult, 
we find ourselves that that's the one constellation that somebody can identify. So chances are you already see it up here. You've already looked, okay? Um, and that is right here. Here's the tail of the dipper, okay? Or the handle of the dipper. And it comes down three stars, four stars. And then here's the end of the cup or the dipper, okay? Made up of four stars. So uh, there's an outline of the Big Dipper just to hold that in space. Then um, this arrow that's here is meant to represent the counterclockwise rotation of the Big Dipper. Okay, so it's going to start sort of at this angle at night, but it's going to rotate counterclockwise around the pole star. So at 815, it'll be right there. But at 1030, it'll probably be up there or a little straighter um, above your head to the north. After you found the Big Dipper, I want you to find the two stars at the end of the cup. The two stars at the end of the cup. Okay, from the bottom of the cup, that star's name is Merak. And then the top of the cup star's name is Dubhe. It's kind of fun to say, right? Marek and Dubhe, they're good old buddies. They're good old friends. And I expect you'll say hi to them every night when you see the Big Dipper. So you take Marek and Dubhe, and then if you line those two stars up, right? At two points, make a line. If you line those two up and you project that line, okay, as it's here in the slides, line those two up and project along that line, and you get to a star of equal brightness. It's about the same brightness as Dupe and Moret. Okay, so it's a star of equal brightness. It's not the brightest star in the night sky. It's not orange or red, or it's not even blue. It's not a particularly special looking star. But that star is Polaris. That's the North Star. And following this technique, you will find the North Star every time, okay? Um, so again, find the Big Dipper wherever it's at. Go to the two stars at the end of the cup. Align those two stars, Marek and Dupe, and then go away from the cup to find Polaris. So just practice that tonight. I guarantee you'll be able to find Polaris. And lo and behold, if you look down here, North, oh yeah, the North Star is right above North, like you might have suspected. Okay, but you know, if you didn't go about the method, you might have called this the North Star, okay, or this the North Star. So going along with the method can really help confirm that you're looking at the North Star. Another way to do this is to just wait an hour, right? Because all of the stars are going to rotate around Polaris. And you'll be able to see that that one star has remained fixed. It's remained in the same spot, okay? Another way to check this, which is really cool. Of course, I think all this stuff is cool. Um, I live at about 45 degrees latitude, okay? That means that Polaris is about 45 degrees off of the horizon from me. So if you lived in Arizona, say, 30, 35 degrees, then the North Star is only about 35 degrees off of the horizon. If you go up to Alaska, right, closer to the Arctic Circle, then the North Star is up here around 75 degrees. So it'd be pretty high in the night sky. So the Pole Star also gives you a kind of a, uh, a Let's see, it gives you a little bit of information on your latitude on the globe between the equator and the pole. I think that's pretty cool too. Okay, um, so again, you're going to line up the pole stars. You're going to go, and I, I didn't say this, about 26 degrees, 25 degrees, 26 degrees. So that would be uh, one of these and a fist, okay, about like that, away from Dubhe and you'll find Polaris, okay? So that's a lot to chew on, but I'll add a little bit more. Um, here is the asterism Big Dipper. 
Big Dipper is the asterism. It's not a true constellation. The true constellation is the big bear, Ursa Major. So let me show you the shape of Ursa Major. We already know what the Big Dipper looks like. Okay, here's the tail of the bear. Yes, the tail of the bear. So, you know, these are legends, these are myths, these are stories. Today, bears, they have a tiny tail. They don't have a big long tail like this, but in the past, cave bears, okay, during the Pleistocene, they had a big tail. And it is thought that a lot of these stories, these oral stories have been passed down uh, and maintain some of these interesting paleontological remnants, like bears with tails. So there's the tail, but let's go ahead and kind of bring it into space. There's the end of the tail, and the rest of the constellation is going to go all the way up here to the tip of the nose. Let's finish off the body. Okay, so there's part of the body is the cup. And then we can use these stars up here to extend the body just a little bit. Okay, then from the body, you got arms and you got legs, right? So let's draw some arms and legs on there. Hopefully you see that. Okay, remove the body. You come down from the shoulder to a star and then an angle to the paws. Again, you come from the rump down to kind of an, uh, a knee joint, an ankle joint, and down to the paws. Okay, there's the paws of Big Dipper, or of, uh, excuse me, of Ursa Major. And then let's finish it off with the head. Okay, there's a couple of faint stars in here. The tip of the nose. And then those faint stars in there, there's two faint stars. Those are the bear's ears. Okay, at least I like to think of those as the bear's ears uh, constellation or asterism. So there's the full Ursa major constellation. Okay, um, now I'm gonna add one last thing in the last five minutes here. Okay, we looked at the Big Dipper. You lined up Marek and Dubhe. You're guided down to Polaris. So those you already know, you're gonna practice it 15 times. If you keep passing through Polaris to the other side of the night sky, so we started off with, with Big Dipper up here in the Northeast. If you pass straight through North and you go over here to the Northwest, we see a star of equal brightness again, okay, that makes, I'll, I'll, I'll illuminate this for a second, I'll, I'll uh, trace this out. Here's that bright star. And if you connect these ones, see that? They make kind of a W shape or an M shape. It depends on how you look at it, right? And what's really great about this, remember the stars spin. So sometimes it is a W, okay? Sometimes it's an M, but it's a pretty recognizable shape. And that is the constellation Cassiopeia. Another common one that maybe you've heard of, maybe somebody pointed it out to you, maybe you know all this stuff already, but there's the constellation Cassiopeia. And I like the stars' names too, if you couldn't tell, like Marek and Dubhe and Polaris. Uh, and this star's name is Cap. So that way you can line up Marek, Dubhe, Polaris, and Cap all in a row. Okay. Um, all right, there's a blank slide. Go ahead and do that for yourself. Maybe you're at the kitchen table and you're looking at this, but just go ahead and point to your screen a little bit and see if you can remember all that stuff already. Okay. Good. I think a few of you are doing that. Great. So uh, yeah, there. I'll send all this stuff out so you can relook at all this stuff at your own convenience. Let me go through it one more time. Here is Big Dipper. We'll use Marek and Dubhe to point down to Polaris. And then if we go past Polaris, we get into Cassiopeia space. That's the M or the W. And then this star's name is Cap. We also learned the extent of the Big Dipper. Okay, here's the tip of the nose and the tip of the tail. 
Here's the front paws as they angle up to the body. And here's the back paws as they angle up toward the body, okay? If you practice those things and just focus on those things, you guys, you're gonna learn it really, really well. Practice it tonight, tomorrow night, a couple more times, and you'll be able to pick out those bear paws and those bear ears like nothing. Okay, uh, so just as some review, here's a little bit of that stuff in black and white. Look north, find the dipper, use the pointer stars, go to Polaris, and then keep going to cap. And what we learned today as far as constellations is just the constellation Ursa Major and Cassiopeia. Okay, um, well, I invite you to come back on April 14th. We'll do the same thing. It'll be uh, via Zoom. It'll likely be recorded as long as this recording went well. Um, and then I'll send you the material, the PowerPoint slides, the worksheet, and the recording afterwards for your, for your own um, educational resources, okay? Um, I was happy to tell you a little bit about stargazing gear and dressing warm. I'm also happy to tell you that setting an intent and a process around stargazing can make it a lot more informative and fun. And then I highly encourage you to be a dark sky or a night, natural night sky advocate, okay? Um, and then contact friends of UIE if you'd like to learn more about that. Or of course, you can just contact me directly if you'd like to talk about the stars, um, maybe talk about your new inquiries, things like that, okay? Uh, well, this has been another fabulous night to talk about uh, the stars with all of you folks. And um, I hope you keep looking up, okay? I hope you all end up outside tonight at around 8.15 to see those glorious constellations, all right? Uh, hopefully see you on April 14th. And um, until then, see you later. Good. I will um, stick around for some question and answer too, if you'd like. Um, you're welcome to stay.